All right. Usually we have the Republicans here on Moss. We have 50% of the Republicans, though, just showed up. And we're still lacking Democrats. We have three Democrats. All right. So we're going to start without objection um, as a subcommittee. So the Senate Committee on Judiciary will come to order. Uh, good afternoon. We're holding this committee hearing in room 2100 of the O Street building, also known as the swing space. I ask that all members of the committee be present in room 2100 so we can establish a quorum and begin the hearing um, as a full committee. Uh, before presentations on today's bill, uh, I'm going to announce the items that are on consent or items that have been pulled to the extent that you are watching on TV or you're here physically present. The filing items should be noted. File number 21, SB 1345 by Senator Smallwood Cuevas has been pulled by the author. Um, and file number 12, SB 1154 by Senator Taro has also been pulled by the author. Uh, now I'm going to announce the items that are on consent today. The items that are on consent are the following. File number 7, SB 896 by Senator Dodd. File number 14, SB 892 by Senator Padilla. File number 15, by uh, SB 893 also by Senator Patia. File number 16, SB 1100 by Senator Portentino. File number 17, SB 1198 by Senator Roth. File number 18, SB 899 by Senator Skinner. And finally, file number 25, SB 1117 by our very own Senator Laird. All right, so uh, seeing that we have Senator Archuleta here, um, why don't we go ahead and begin with SB 1465, file item number one. Senator Archuleta, um, we will proceed as a subcommittee. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, sit on. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Mr. Chair. <laughs> and uh, I know he likes that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Chair and, and committee members, thank you. Today I'm presenting Senate Bill 1465, which allows any structure used for human habitation to be declared a substandard building, regardless of zoning or approval use. Uh, Senate Bill 1465 also makes changes to code enforcement procedures to extend tenant protections to buildings not zoned residential, but used for housing. California state housing laws are some of the strongest in the nation, establishing health and safety protection through building building standards to ensure decent, safe, and sanitary housing for all of Californians. California is experiencing a housing shortage of significant proportions, particularly in the affordable housing sector. Individuals and families unable to find affordable housing may resort to living in buildings that have not yet been zoned residential. Despite being rented as housing, many warehouses, factories, and buildings are not in residential zones and have uh, evaded much needed safety inspections and code enforcement. Current law provides protection for residents that live in a dwelling that is not up to code, but puts the resident or the public in harm's way. However, there is an ambiguity in the law about whether these protections apply to buildings not residentially zoned, even if they are being inhabited by the tenants. Tenants in these buildings are among the most disadvantaged renters in California. They do not control, may they not even know the zoning of the building they're residing in. Substandard conditions and their associated dangers for tenants do not cease to exist just because of their building zoning. This bill has no opposition. With me today to testify is Faith Borges on behalf of the California Association of Code Enforcement Officers. And I respectfully ask for your I vote. And uh, he is, he, she is here to uh, ask any uh, and answer any technical questions. Thank you. If you'd like to testify, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Senator Archuleta. Chair and members, my name is Faith Borges with Actum, proudly representing the California Association of Code Enforcement Officers, here today to testify in support of Senate Bill 1465, which will allow existing inspections and code enforcement to be applied to any structure used for human habitation, regardless of the building's zoning or approved use. SB 1465 additionally applies habitability and landlord tenant protections to these properties, ensuring that tenants have access to vital resources such as relocation assistance and retaliation protections for raising habitability complaints. 
California, Californians have been driven into living in warehouses, sheds, and other unpermitted residences by California's housing crisis. Um, and are currently cut off for resources available to tenants in buildings properly zoned for housing. Thanks to the work of many legislators on this committee and stakeholders in this room, Californians' inspections and tenant protection laws are amongst the strongest in the nation. Yet these protections still exclude many of the state's most vulnerable tenants. Tenants do not determine whether the building they live in is zoned and used properly, and Californians should not be punished for resorting to living in makeshift, unapproved housing units due to the state's housing crisis. A lack of affordable housing is the crisis of a generation, and while there are many points that we could make about that on a macro scale, we'd like to take a moment to share the impact of these consequences of treating unsafe housing as a substitute for affordable housing. Recently, I spoke with a grieving mother who lost her daughter in the ghost ship fire on December 2nd, 2016, and out of respect for her privacy, we'll keep her identity anonymous. However, we have her permission to relay the following. My daughter was a vibrant soul who loved her community in Oakland. She was one of three dozen people who passed away in the preventable fire at the ghost ship warehouse. Following her death, I toured the dilapidated warehouse and saw the alarming conditions that people were living in. I cannot tell you how difficult it is to know that that's where my daughter died. I don't wish to attack any of the residents of the warehouse or anyone who finds themselves I, living. I should have announced the preliminary rules beforehand. Um, we're gonna allow two minutes to each witness on, for the proponents and two minutes for each witness for the opponents. I didn't announce that, but go ahead and take another 30 seconds. Apologize, I'll be succinct. Um, SB 1465 is about fairness to Californians who, through no fault of their own, have had to resort in living buildings that haven't been zoned residential. This bill would provide them with invaluable protections, and we ask for your eye vote. Thank you very much. Um, before we proceed, uh, Senator Archuleta, I'd like to establish a quorum. Madam Secretary, if you would call the roll for purposes of establishing a quorum. Umberg? Here. Umberg here. Wilk? Present. Wilk present. Allen? Ashby? Caballero? Here. Caballero here. Durazo? Grasso here, Laird, Laird here, Min, Nilo, here. Nilo here, Stern, here. Stern here, Wahab. You have a quorum. All right, great, thank you. All right, Senator Archuleta, do you have another witness? Uh, no, I don't. Sir. All right, uh, anyone else in support of SB uh, 1465, please approach the microphone. Andrew Mendoza on behalf of the California building officials in support. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one else approach the microphone. If you're in opposition to SB 1465, please approach the microphone. Seeing no one approaching the microphone, let's bring it back to committee for questions or comments by committee members. Questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, is there, Senator Lair moves the bill. Senator Archuleta, would you like to close? I respectfully ask for your eye vote. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. This is file item number one, SB 1465. The motion is due pass to Senate appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? Aye. Wilk, aye. Allen? Ashby? Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Durazo? Aye. Durazo, aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Min? Nilo? Aye. Nilo, aye. Stern? Aye. Stern, aye. Wahab? You have uh, seven to zero. 7 0. We're going to place that bill on call. Thank you, Thank you Senator Mr. Chair. Archuleta. All right, let's go ahead and. Uh... Oh, yes, Senator. I Lair. was going to say, if it's okay with the chair, I would move the consent agenda. You read my mind. Okay. All right. Thank you, Senator Laird. Senator Laird has moved the consent calendar. <laughs> on the consent calendar, Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? Aye. Wilk, aye. Allen? Ashby? Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Durazo? Aye. Durazo, aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, I, Min, Nilo, aye. Nilo, I, Stern, aye. Stern, I, Wahab. Seven to zero on the consent calendar. All right, calendar. seven zero, put the consent calendar on call. All right, so here's the line. Senator Becker is here, so we're going to hear from Senator Becker, who has two bills, then Senator Blakespear. All right, uh, Senator Becker, if you'd like, the floor is yours. You know what, before you go, Senator Becker, I, I'm remiss in that I did not uh, basically go over the, the rules of the road here. So here are the rules of the road for all the bills that we'll hear today. Um, 
we will allow two primary witnesses in support and two primary witnesses in opposition. Uh, for the primary witnesses in support, each will have two minutes unless there's been some exemption. And same thing for the witnesses, the primary witnesses in opposition, each will have two minutes. After support, we'll hear from others who may provide their name, their affiliation, and their position on the bill. They'll approach the microphone. And the same thing with the opposition, name, affiliation, and position, you approach the microphone. So, uh, Senator Becker, having said that, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm here today to present SB 942, the California Artificial Intelligence Transparency Act. Uh, this is a bill that takes a, um, a bold step in addressing the proliferation of AI-generated content. As AI technology advances, distinguishing between human and machine-generated content is becoming increasingly challenging. This ambiguity poses significant societal and democratic uh, risks, exacerbating problems such as disinformation, harassment, and fraud. We've all heard about recent deepfake incidents. Uh, these incidents can also, uh, and this technology, can have a negative impact on our economy. Uh, last year, an AI-generated photo of an explosion near the Pentagon went viral, causing economic market instability. Fraudsters can exploit generative AI uh, for scam calls. We've already seen that. The uh, Chronicle had a story recently about a family, uh, they got a call from their son. He just got into an accident. Uh, they were very distressed about it. He put his lawyers on the on the phone. They wired money uh, to the lawyer. Turned out it wasn't their son at all. It was uh, AI it generated uh, from the voice. Only if, from even a few seconds of someone's voice now, um, you can generate um, uh, something that sounds like them, which is crazy, but true. Uh, clearly, transparency is needed here. The EU has taken steps to address these issues uh, through the AI Act, um, which mandates transparency standards, including the requirement to inform users when they're interacting with an AI system and to clearly uh, mark synthetic audio, video, text, and images as artificially generated or manipulated, both for users and in a machine-readable format. SB 942 uh, has some similarities to that. It serves to address this growing uncertainty regarding AI-generated images by requiring gen AI companies, large gen AI companies, to do a few things, three things particularly. Number one, label AI-generated content with visible and imperceptible embedded disclosures. Two, supply an AI detection tool for users to query whether content was created by AI. And third, enforce third-party licenses to the extent technically feasible to prevent undisclosed content publication. Uh, this act serves to address the challenges posed by AI-generated content, promoting transparency, accountability, and trust in the digital landscape. I would say we are actively collaborating. This is a complicated area, obviously a fast-moving area, a lot of interest, of course, in this area. Um, and um, as it is very complicated, we are working collaboratively with the opposition to address their concerns and try to ensure the bill strikes the right balance in regulating generative AI for the benefit of all Californians. And uh, with me, I have uh, Tom Kemp. Uh, he's a um, been an entrepreneur in cybersecurity and a data privacy advocate. Thank you, Senator Becker. Good afternoon, Chair Umberg and committee members. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. The floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Tom Kemp, and I'm here today to voice my support for SB 942. As a way of background, I'm an entrepreneur that founded a cybersecurity that was one of the first companies that used AI to detect cyber attacks. I subsequently have worked with uh, Californians for Consumer Privacy on Prop 24, uh, also with Senator Becker on the California Delete Act, and I wrote a book uh, that details the guardrails needed for AI. In 2021, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai said this, quote, I view AI as the most profound technology that humanity will ever develop and work on. But if AI is as powerful as he claims, then it should be held to the same standards of honesty and transparency as a pack of gum that has barcodes and labeling uh, uh, on it. Now we've had food labeling laws since 1906. These laws not only require standardized disclosures, but also prohibit misbranding that is false or misleading. So here we are in 2024, and it's becoming increasingly clear that it is difficult to differentiate between human-generated content and machine-generated content via Gen AI or synthetic content. 
SB 942 addresses this problem. It simply says a provider must label its content and provide a way for a consumer to ask, hey, did you create this? So a few key, uh, key points here. First, the bill doesn't mention watermarking. It's not prescriptive. It simply says you have to put some sort of label. It gives us time for standards to be set forth down the road. Second, it does not require the content providers to detect other people's. It simply needs to answer the question, hey, did you, did you create this, yes or no? And then third, if you even ask ChatGPT, it says, hey, we don't, have a, we don't know how to detect AI. We can't do that. So it's not redundant uh, in this bill to ask the large providers to actually specify whether or not they generate this content. Right. In thank summary, you, Mr. Kemp, you thank you very much. Oh, perfect, thank you. All right, other witnesses in support of SB 942? Seeing no one approach the microphone, anyone wish to testify in Me Too support, please approach the microphone. Seeing no one approaching, let's turn to the opposition. If you're opposed to SB 942, I see um, at least one person approaching. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Dylan Hoffman on behalf of TechNet. We're respectfully opposed to SB 942 at this time. Um, we fully agree with the intent of uh, the bill to create greater trust in user-generated content online. Um, by fostering the adoption of content provenance verifications and watermarks. Um, and we look forward to providing much more substantive feedback uh, and working with the author to, to offer amendments. We've been a little backlogged reviewing a lot of bills, not only in this state, but across the country. Um, just wanna point out a couple of issues with the bill as it currently ex exists in print um, and that we believe um, present some issues as far as technical feasibility and impossibility with, with compliance. Um, and first, while we understand the desire to regulate an emerging technology and one with su substantial capabilities, um, this is an, inner, an area where we believe would uh, benefit from um, federal oversight and action. Um, won't be holding our breath on that, but many of our companies and platforms are at the forefront of developing this type of technology, but important to remember that it's still very much in its early stages. Um, However, despite that, SB 942 enacts requirements for technology that is currently rapidly evolving, such as um, requiring uh, a watermark or content provenance for text um, generated content. Um, it's our understanding that's not currently possible. And so we think um, there are some reasonable amendments to sort of tailor this bill to what is and is not um, uh, capable at this time. Um, also want to point out that currently content provenance and watermarking is still incredibly unreliable. Um, and in ma many cases, very easy to break. Uh, researchers at the University of Maryland, for example, were able to break all of the currently available watermarking methods. Um, some of these can be accomplished uh, simply uh, by cropping, resizing, or screenshotting an image. More concerning though, these researchers were also able to insert fake watermarks and credentials into images, creating false positives. Um, so we think that uh, any legislation on this topic should account for that unreliability and that, um, that potential. And lastly, we believe that um, if these laws do exceed our, our technological capabilities, there is a risk for uh, consumers to place too much trust um, in those right. watermarks. Sounds like you're about to wrap up. I am about to wrap yep. up. Um, and so for these reasons, we are respectfully opposed again at this time, but look forward to continuing our conversations with the author and sponsors of the bill. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right. Others in opposition to SB 942. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Author Robert Mutri, California Chamber of Commerce, also in opposition for the reasons stated. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's bring it back to committee. Committee members, questions, yeah. comments? Seeing none. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Senator Nielo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so the, the opposition uh, is fundamentally um, based upon uh, techno this not being technologically possible right now. Now, California Air Resources Board has regulations that are not technically technologically possible either, so why not you? But I digress. Seriously, how do you respond to that? Um, sure, I will comment on your first part. It's a longer discussion, uh, but um, yeah, I, I'd say that, you know, technology is evolving and that's why we are uh, working with them. Um, I'd say we agree with them since that's why this is really focused on disclosure. We don't uh, reference watermarking or prescribe a, a particular technology. And we only require a vendor that they detect AI generated content from their platform. Um, so I'd say, I, I think 
the way we're trying to uh, position this, uh, uh, you know, aligns with the fact that this is rapidly evolving. And um, that's what we're trying to be, to be sensitive to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Niello. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, is there a motion? Senator Laird moves the bill. Uh, thank you, Senator Laird. All right, would you like to close, Senator Becker? I um, appreciate that. Again, I appreciate the comments um, uh, from the opposition. Yeah, this is rapidly evolving. Um, obviously, a great deal of interest, and um, uh, I think we're on the right track and look forward to keep moving this forward and keep discussions going. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Becker, for your commitment to continue to work with them. It sounds like that, that this is still a work in progress. So, all right. Um, Madam Secretary, if you'd call the roll. This is file item number two, SB 942. The motion is due pass the Senate Governmental Organization. Humberg? Aye. Humberg, aye. Wilk? No. Wilk, no. Allen? Ashby? Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Durazo? Aye. Durazo, aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Min? Nilo? Aye. Nilo, aye. Stern? Aye. Stern, aye. Wahab? Aye. Wahab, aye. Seven to one. Seven one. All right, we'll put that back on call. Next is item number three, SB twelve twenty three, and then after that will be uh, item number four, SB ten sixty six. I see Senator Blakesford is here. All right, Senator Becker. Great, thank you, um, uh, Chair members. Again, um, now we're moving from a topic that has a lot of uh, awareness, I think, and um, a lot of focus to one that maybe people aren't focused on yet. But it's a, um, I think, as you'll hear, especially from our witnesses, who are some of the top. Uh, neuroscientists in the country, um, this is a, uh, a real and growing issue and an important one to get in front of. This is SB 1223, the California Neuro Rights Act, a bill that amends the California Consumer Privacy Act to enhance protection for California's neural data. Now, you may have heard that Neuralink, it's a company that uh, Elon Musk co-founded, recently made headlines for implanting a chip called uh, telepathy in a person's brain. Uh, for those who didn't hear, uh, this chip reads signals from a paralyzed patient's brain and transmits them to a computer, enabling control of the computer from a user's thoughts. Uh, invasive devices like this, like telepathy, uh, are classified as medical products, and they are subject to robust data privacy protections under HIPAA and the California Medical Information Act. However, there's also a growing class, as we'll hear, of non-invasive neurotech products. Like their medical counterparts, these non-invasive devices record brain data using EEG sensors, but as they're not considered medical devices, they're not federally regulated, allowing companies to collect and sell user data. This unregula unregulated collection of neural data, uh, I believe, hope you agree with me, uh, raises privacy concerns. Companies could compile massive databases of brain scans, uh, potentially revealing private medical information without consent or even identifying individuals without their permission. The CCPA protects sensitive personal information like social security, financial data, biometrics, but it doesn't cover this a new emerging area of neural data. Uh, this gap leaves individuals vulnerable. Uh, again, this, this data can reveal intimate data about details, about thoughts, emotions, intentions. Um, this bill addresses these concerns by defining neural data and neural technology, classifying neural data as sensitive personal information, and extending the CCPA protections to neural data. Regulating this emerging field, and again, we have a chance to get in front of this, is crucial to ensure ethical use, protect privacy, establish standards, and, and uh, address future concerns. Uh, with me, again, I have uh, Professor Rafael Huste, who's a founder of the Neuro Rights Foundation, one of the world's leading experts and, and leading neuroscientists, and Jared Genzer, who's the international, international human rights attorney uh, on the board of the Neuro Rights Foundation. All right, thank you, Senator. Uh, first witness, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chair Umberg, uh, Vice Chair Wilkes, uh, Senator Becker, Senators and representatives of the people of California. My name is uh, Rafael Yuste. I'm an MD, PhD, I'm a medic, I went into basic research because we cannot uh, cure brain diseases until we understand how the brain works. Uh, and the way we do this uh, is through neurotechnology, which are sounds very complicated, it's very straightforward. There are devices 
that could be electrical, optical, magnetic, acoustical, to do two things, to either record the activity of the brain or to change the activity of the brain. That's the cutting edge of neuroscience. And just about 10 years ago, I had an Oppenheimer moment. We work with mice in the lab developing neurotechnology, and we were able to decode what a mouse was looking at and manipulate it. So we made the mouse think he was looking at things that were in there. We took over control of his perception. And that for me was an Oppenheimer moment because what we can do in a mouse today, we can do in a human tomorrow. And at that point, uh, I, uh, I team up with, uh, with uh, human rights lawyer, uh, Jared Genser, and we created this foundation. Uh, and I've devoted a lot of my time in pro bono fashion without getting paid to, uh, to uh, alert people to advocate for the protection of brain data. No? Because the brain is not just another organ of the body, it's the organ that generates all of your mental and cognitive activities, your thoughts, your emotions, your memories, your imagination, everything comes from there. No? So you can read and write information of the brain into the brain. You can decode and manipulate mental activity. Um, this is not science fiction. Uh, one of the letters in support of the bill of Senator Becker is from one of your own uh, experts here in California, Professor Eddie Chang. He's probably the world's expert at decoding brain activity from patients. So you may have read about him in the newspaper. And he called me up a year ago in the middle of the night because they were able to decode the uh, language and the emotions and the facial gestures of a paralyzed woman. And he couldn't sleep because of the implication that that has. They essentially cloned the, the woman in a digital avatar. No? And this is fantastic for science and medicine, but of course this has to be Thank you, doctor. protected. Thank you, Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Umberg, Vice Chairman Wilk, and members of the committee. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jared Genser. I'm an international human rights lawyer. Um, I'm here today um, because, as Senator Becker said, um, you know, we're in support of SB uh, 1223. Um, we are not concerned about implantable brain computer interfaces, um, what happens in a medical context, because they're already heavy, heavily regulated as medical devices. We're worried about consumer neurotechnologies. Um, and today, consumer neurotechnologies are using medical grade EEG scanners primarily, right? If it was in a medical context, you would have to have had a license from the FDA, but the very same kind of scanner can be used in a consumer context with no license at all. And unlike in a medical context where all of the health data is heavily protected under HIPAA and state privacy laws, there are literally no protections at all for neural data that is gathered in uh, consumer devices. These consumer devices, 30 of them that we found online that can be purchased today, do all different kinds of things, helping you with meditation, helping you with your sleep. You can fly a helicopter drone using your thoughts uh, as a game, uh, all different kinds of things. But these are devices because they are medical grade that are downloading from gigabytes to terabytes of your brain data. They need typically 1% or less of that data to decode for their narrow purpose. But all of this other data is being gathered. Now you might say, well, shouldn't the CCPA protect this kind of data? I mean, gosh, it's medical grade neural data, but actually it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because if you look at the definition of personal information and what's protected under the CCPA, the CCPA protects biometric data, but neural data is not biometric. It's not captured from outside your body to identify you. Um, it's not biological data either, because in fact, it's electrical. My colleague could speak more about that if you wanted to know, but um, in 2018, when you adopted the CCPA, there were very few of these devices available, so nobody was thinking about it. And nobody would have imagined that there would be this massive unintentional loophole in the CCPA, that because um, neural data is not biometric or biological, it just simply isn't covered under any of the categories of protection, which means that today, um, any of these 30 companies that are out there, and we're about to publish a report actually tomorrow, that's very, very detailed, looking at um, the privacy agreements. Of these thank you very much. You've yeah. appropriately scared all of us. So, all right, all right, thank you. All right, all right, let, let's turn now, others in support. All right, if you're in support of SB 1223, please approach the microphone. All right, seeing no one else in support, if you're in opposition to SB 1223, please approach. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Dylan Hoffman on behalf of TechNet. Uh, respectfully opposed and less amended to SB 1223. Um, our members place a, a very high priority on consumer privacy and are fully committed to securing privacy and security 
safety for the consumers. Um, we also believe that these laws need to adapt um, to changing technologies, as we've just heard, um, and have no issue with the intent to provide greater protections for devices that have direct connections or that measure brainwaves. Um, we have a concern about the breadth of technologies that could be included under these current definitions. We've suggested amendments that we think appropriately tailor them um, to the technologies that directly measure brain activity. Um, this stems sort of from the, the fundamental challenge um, that they include references to the peripheral nervous system. Uh, we think this could uh, include um, technologies such as um, monitoring movements of a computer mouse or of uh, drowsy driving monitors in, in cars. Um, so. Like I mentioned, we've suggested amendments that um, I think maintain the bill's focus on the riskiest kinds of informations um, while still without unintentionally uh, impacting some of these low risk uses. Um, and for this reason, we think that you know being over inclusive actually doesn't benefit consumers in this um, way because it will likely result in more information being classified as neural data, stuff that isn't actually measuring your brain waves, um, causing consumers who receive such a notice for example, their, their wearable or their watch, um, to believe that much more sensitive in, information is being gathered than it is. Um, we're very much looking forward to um, working with the author and the sponsors to, to try to um, narrow those definitions and tailor that appropriately, And, and um, but at this time, respectfully oppose unless amended. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Others in opposition? Good afternoon again, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair and members. Uh, Rob Mujer, California Chamber of Commerce, opposed for the same technical reasons as stated by Techna. Thank you. Arnie, thank you very much. Others in opposition, seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's bring it back to a frightened committee uh, for questions or comments. Uh, yes. All right, Senator Wahab has moved the bill. Questions? Yes, Senator Caballero. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the testimony here today. Um, I had a totally different thought in my mind uh, about what we were talking about, so I really appreciate the information. Um, this bill has been in print since uh, mid-February. Have you had outreach from any of the opposition in regards to amendments that might be appropriate? Yeah, I, I think last week we got some amendments and um, we'll going through them. And again, I think I'd say as with the previous bill, you know, our intention is not to stifle this technology. Certainly, obviously, they're very positive uh, medical benefits uh you know to it um so we will very much work with them and and again i think you know try to accomplish the goals of the bill while still being uh, narrow and not stifling technology but we're still i'd say we're still working through them okay because i i am um, I, I i did not see any amendments and i'm concerned that as it goes through the process that you're contacted early enough to be able to take the amendments that makes sense so that we can understand what we're doing. This is a yeah. new area for us. Yeah. And so any time that we deal with a new area um, that is technical and complicated, we wanna make sure we get it right. I know you work very hard at trying to find the middle ground, and so I appreciate that. Um, but I also wanna encourage the communication so that we can so that we can look at it and we don't have to wait till it gets over to the assembly and we the Senate hasn't had a chance to consider it as well. So yeah, um, appreciate your your working, your your commitment to continue working on this. Okay, I appreciate uh, that. All right, thank you, Madam Appropriations Chair. All right, uh, Senator Senator Stern. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. A brave new world. Appreciate you forcing us to recognize we live in it already. Um, I would just my my comment. Has the bill been moved? Yeah, Senator Wahab is. Okay, so bills been moved. I'll be supporting just to. Keep us informed. I, I fear over over narrowing of the definition as you move forward. Um, specifically in the opposition's comments, they say this bill should only be about uh, technology that reveals someone's inner thoughts and mental processes. That that's the sole sort of narrow scope of the bill. I, I worry that just the, your innermost thoughts is actually that's too narrow. Right, that that there's that the, it's all that I don't know how to describe the data. You you define it that electrical data that's coming, that 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 can come from the brain that can also be detecting the rest of the nervous system. I mean that that sort of I don't think a consumer is going to be able to distinguish between is my innermost thought or is this just generic brainwave data? And what we've heard is I think the 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 algorithm uh, the AI doesn't need it just needs a little bit of any of that data to then do the sort of reverse engineering that it gets scary. So I, that would just be a request or a, yeah. a comment going forward to be hyper vigilant now, and then we can sort of work through the, the issues as they resolve. So thanks. 
I appreciate Thank it. You. Mr. Chair, would it be appropriate? Could I have my witnesses? This is a new area for all of us. Could I ask him to uh, address that from the sense of the, the, the narrowing versus broader definition? Sure. Why don't we take the comments okay, and then sure. we'll yeah. see. We'll have a wrap up yeah. from one of the witnesses. Other comments or questions? Seeing no other comments or questions. Okay, fine. Senator yeah. Becker. Yes, it's important to note, and I hope um, I'm sure Senator Becker can get to all of you. Uh, we provided an eight page response to their letter and proposed amendments in detail to demonstrate that they just simply didn't understand the technology. I'm not aware of any medical qualifications of the people who wrote their letter, but we have one of the world's leading experts here. In short, um, none of the things that they're concerned about would be possible um, under the definition that we're proposing for neurotechnology, which is that it has to be a technology that connects directly to the central or peripheral nervous system, and it can only be processed by the use of a neurotechnology device. That data can only be processed in that way. So if you're talking about a person who's falling asleep with a video monitor pointed at them driving a car, it's not connected to the nervous system in any way, and it can't be processed by a neurotechnological device. So we've intentionally excluded in the language all of the issues that they've raised a specific concern. And uh, you know, Dr. Houston could speak further if you wanted about the peripheral nervous system, but quite clearly, um, I think, you know, I would hope that they'd take a closer look at the letter and we can provide the letter to all of you. Right. Unless Senator Stern wants more information, I think we're okay. All right. Um, so Senator Stearns asked for a letter. All right. Uh, Senator Becker, would you like to close? Well, thank you. I can see the uh, expressions and some of the faces as, uh, as this was, when I first started learning about this, it is, it's, it's, it's um, even representing Silicon Valley, this is really brave, brave new world stuff. But as we've heard, it is, it, uh, it is here. And I appreciate you all um, indulging the conversation. Look, respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. It's been moved by Senator Wahab. Madam Secretary, if you'd call the roll. This is file item number three, SB 1223. The motion is to pass the Senate appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? <laughs> he, he wants you just to, he, he's thinking it right now. Aye. Yeah, right, right. I guess I guess we're not there yet. <laughs> right, you, 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 right, right. Wilk, aye. Allen? Allen, aye. Ashby? Ashby, aye. Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Durazo? Durazo, I Laird, Laird, I Min, Nilo, I. Nilo, I Stern, I. Stern, I Wahab, Wahab, I. You have ten to zero. Uh, ten zero. We're going to put that on call. Um, all right. Uh, next is Senator Blakesphere. Thank you, Senator Becker. Next, is Senator Blakesphere. Then Senator Bradford. Then Senator Eggman. All right. Senator Blakesphere. Item number four. Um, SB ten sixty six. Thank you, Chair. This is a much lower tech issue that we're just describing next. Do I have permission to show a picture of a pyrotechnic marine flare box of them? All right, thank you. So this is what I'll be talking about. Um, first, I wanna start by thanking the committee staff for working with my office and the sponsors on amendments. We gladly accept them. SB 1066 is a common sense measure to ensure the safe disposal of these pyrotechnic marine flares. The U.S. Coast Guard requires that vessels that are longer than 16 feet and are operating on oceans carry approved visual distress signals for use in emergencies. Most often, boaters carry three pyrotechnic flares that are approved for both day and nighttime use. There are several brands of battery-powered alternatives, but some boaters prefer the flares due to their increased visibility during the day. These flares expire 42 months after manufacture, meaning they no longer satisfy Coast Guard requirements. Unused, expired marine flares cannot be disposed of in the regular trash or the recycling. They are explosives and they must be taken to a facility permitted to accept explosives. Flares also contain chemicals that cause pollution and harm to human health. The California Division of Boating and Waterways estimates 174,000 flares expire in the state each year. And the problem is that nearly all household hazardous waste facilities refuse to accept them. In fact, Alameda County is the only county in California that we found that could actually act actively accept flare flares, and even they lack the permits necessary to actually dispose of them. As far as we know, there's only one facility in the country that currently accepts flares for disposal, and it is over 1,500 miles away in Missouri. Without viable options, boaters have reported storing them on their boat, shooting them into the air, or dumping them into the ocean. Stockpiled flares are a fire hazard. Shooting a distress signal outside of an emergency is is a federal felony. Dumping unused flares can leach toxic metals and other pollutants into the water. Expired flares can end up in the trash or left in front of local government buildings, just as this box was done, like fire and police stations. This results in high costs borne by local governments as they then become responsible for arranging proper disposal. 
These costs are socialized onto local taxpayers instead of the boaters who use them. We are actively collaborating with Orion Signals, the primary producer of marine flares, and the Recreational Boaters Association to ensure the costs are not so high that boaters stop carrying these emergency safety devices. SB 1066 will put the responsibility for funding and operating a convenient take-back system onto the producers with oversight by the Department of Toxic Substances Control. SB 1066 is sponsored is supported by a broad coalition of stakeholders, including local governments, park districts, Teamsters, California professional firefighters, individual fire districts, waste haulers, harbor districts, and environmental and public health organizations. With me today, I'm very happy to have Jordan Wells on behalf of the National Stewardship Action Council as a co-sponsor of this bill, and John Kennedy on behalf of the Rural County Representatives of California. If I may invite them to come to the microphone. Certainly, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blake Spear, Chair and members. We greatly appreciate the committee's work on this bill and the proposed amendments. I am Jordan Wells with the National Stewardship Action Council, a nonprofit organization that advocates for an equitable circular economy. We are proud to co-sponsor SB 1066 with Zero Waste Sonoma, which will solve the marine flare waste disposal problem that is absolutely impacting our cities and counties, especially those located on California's coast. Local governments across the state are having to turn away residents with unwanted marine flares, leaving them with no solution. Desperate for solutions, they acquired over a quarter of a million dollars in California state grant funding for marine flare disposal pilot projects, which have included temporary collection events. We obtained the data from these grant projects as well as other local governments and have found the cost to manage these explosives varies widely, but as low as $10.55 for Alameda County. A statewide program will result in greater efficiencies of scale and significantly reduce transportation and thereby overall costs that can't be realized with siloed programs and events. We have had two meetings with Orion and the Recreational Boaters of California and have been providing the data we've collected and, and are eager to work with them to create the most cost-effective solution and system possible. SB 1066 will not restrict boaters' choices as we are not banning the flares. Voters will still be able to purchase flares. However, the cost of disposal will, will no longer be paid for by all ratepayers, whether they own a boat, or, a boat or not. SB 1066 follows California's 16-year history of shifting responsibility for the end-of-life management of product waste to producers to ensure these costs are no longer inequitably distributed. Thank you for your leadership, Senator Blake Spear. Chair and members, I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others in support? Good afternoon, John Kennedy with RCRC, the Rural County Representatives of California. We represent 40 counties uh, of the state's 58 counties, Sonoma being our largest member. Um, first off, we recognize the importance and the life-saving value of marine flares, um, but we strongly support SB 1066. Uh, local governments responsible for solid waste management, including management of hazardous waste and household hazardous waste. We run HHW collection facilities, both permanent facilities and temporary events. As you've heard, marine flares are very difficult for us to manage and costly. In our experience with some of our members, it's been about $43 a flare. Again, many times the cost it costs a consumer to buy these at the point of sale. Um, we see these come into our facilities. Sometimes people try to bring them by. Um, sometimes they will come through in load check programs where they just get thrown in the trash. Um, we have a really difficult decision to make as local governments. If we turn them away from our facilities, there's a pretty strong chance that someone's going to dump them illegally on the side of a road or somewhere else where we will have to take ownership of those and then manage them regardless. Um, and as I said, they're difficult. They're costly to manage. So, um, we support 1066 because it requires the establishment of an EPR program. Um, the producers uh, bring these uh, marine flares into the stream of commerce for very valid purposes, but they're not concerned with the end of life management costs or challenges of disposal. A PRO will be able to coordinate and facilitate the collection of events across the state, offer safe and convenient disposal opportunities for boaters and for others, and it will reduce costs for local governments and our HHW management programs. So for those reasons, we're very pleased to support 1066. Thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others who wish to testify provide their name, their affiliation, and their position. Michelle Rolgava with Nielsen Merksmer on behalf of Waste Management in support. Thank you. Matt Broad on behalf of the Teamsters in support. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Sparks Kranz with the League of California Cities in support. Thank you. Good afternoon. Kira Ross on behalf of the town of Truckee in support. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, Lindsay Goldhorn with Capital Advocacy on behalf of the Resource Recovery Coalition of California and support. Thank you. David Krieger for Waste Connections and support. Thank you. Thank you. Kayla Robinson on behalf of Rethink Waste and Support. Thank you. Thank you. Crystal Kijos here on behalf of a few clients, Stop Waste, Western Placer Waste Management Authority, Solid Waste Association of North America Legislative Task Force, all in support. And then on behalf of the California Products Stewardship Council, we're in supporting concept. Thank you. Thank you. Josh Cogger on behalf of the County of Santa Barbara in support. Thank you. Ryan Elaine on behalf of the California Retailers Association in support. Thank you. Chris Grogan on behalf of Republic Services in support. Thank you. Doug Subers on behalf of the California Professional Firefighters in support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, and sorry, oh. I have permission from the following organizations. The North American Hazardous Materials Management Association, Zero Waste Sonoma, our co-sponsor, Serious Signal, Save Our Shores, Clean Water Action, Marin Sanitary Service, Ban Single Use Plastics, Northern California Recycling Association, Sea Hugger, Zero Waste USA, the City of South Thousand Oaks, and Napa Recycling and Waste Services. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Others in support. Mr. Chair, Louis Sanchez on behalf of the California Waste Haulers Council in support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's turn to the opposition. If you're opposed to SB 1066, please approach the microphone. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. Jim Lights on behalf of Orion Safety Products. We appreciate the engagement we've had with the author and the sponsors of the bill to this point. We look forward to those continued discussions. I think our biggest concern is the scope of the proposed program. As your uh, analysis points out, total sales for 2023 of the largest producer of marine flares were only $465,000. Uh, presumably, the price of the product will have to go up to fund this type of program, and we're concerned about how much that increase may be to, to fund this program. Um, not all flares are created equal. Uh, Handheld flares are easier to burn off after their expiration date than aerial flares. And so we look forward to working with the proponents to find a program that is uh, appropriate in scale and effective. We've also found that ongoing programs, when they start, tend to have a, a fair degree of collections. And as they continue, because the flares last for at least four years, those collections tend to go down. Uh, and so we think periodic programs that might have lower costs to the producer might indeed be more effective in the long run. Uh, so with that, we do, again, look forward to continuing to work with the author to find a solution here. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Chair and members, Jerry Desmond with Recreational Boaters of California, coming from a slightly different perspective, as has been mentioned by the sponsors and the author and others. Uh, public safety is a paramount here. Um, you have to have three flares if you're going off the coast uh, in your boat. And we want to make sure that as a program is established, it is not a deterrent to a boater to purchase a new flare that would have the embedded cost of an EPR program. We, we have to get to a number that works. At this point, we're not there, but we are working collaboratively. Some of the information we're finding is very interesting. Uh, the boaters have paid through state monies for California Boating Clean and Green to put these programs out there, have encouraged our constituents to go to these programs. And some of the data that's coming out is very interesting. Like, what does a boater do with his flare? Uh, the Alameda uh, survey uh, that was conducted found that uh, 53% of boat, oh, all the 153 boaters that participated had an average of 48 flares each. The San Francisco event that was held of 53% of 62 boaters said they keep their flares at their homes or on their boat as spares and supplies. So there's a pent up uh, 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 inventory of flares that will have to be addressed as well. And then we compound it with the fact that the company that produces the flares is almost a you know is a, a dominant in California. So if it's going to be able to raise the costs, uh, and it will. Um, where is that impact on voters? So we're trying to thread that needle. We're involved collaboratively with the sponsors and the senator, and we're hoping we can get there, but at this moment, we're not there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Others in opposition, please approach the microphone. Mr. Chair, members, Sarah Nocito on behalf of the National Marine Manufacturers Association and respectful opposition. Thank you. Others in opposition, seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's bring it back to the committee. Mr. Chair. 
Yes, Senator Laird. <clears throat> Let me say first that I think that it would be great if Senator Allen's extended producer responsibility were adopted and then I wouldn't be doing propane, propane canisters. You wouldn't be doing this, but that hasn't happened yet. On point, uh, when I was elected to the assembly, there was a highway safety flare plant in Morgan Hill that it turned out had released things out the back door for 30 or 40 years. There was a seven mile plume of contaminated water with perchlorate. And when people talk about costs, it was millions and millions and millions of dollars. And there's one that existed in Senator Stern's district and there's one that existed in the Inland Empire. And what it, it, it required water treatment at the surface uh, uh, in a way that when people were worried about really small costs, it was the government that actually inherited the really large costs. People in one area were for years delivered bottled water and could not use the water that was in their neighborhood. And so it is not just the these being piled up somewhere. It is not just a smaller cost. If we do not address this, it's a massive cost that falls on local governments and state governments in a clear way. And so I think it's very important to reach the agreement. I take seriously the opposition's comments, but there's much more at stake uh, uh, in this if these are not properly disposed of. And so I salute you for bringing the bill and I would move the bill. Thank you. All right, other questions or comments? Senator Laird has moved the bill. Seeing no further questions or comments, would you like to, oh, I'm sorry. You, you put your hand up. I back sent it there. to you. I don't know why you're not receiving right. it. I don't think we've quite reached that level. Of well, technology. I have. You have it. Okay. All right. I'm, <laughs> yes. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. I, all right. All right. All right. So I think, yeah. So I think this is a great bill. I think those people should be paying the cost of it. And if the flourish costs more, the, the flourish costs more because it's, you know, they shouldn't put those costs on on other people and they i'm sorry but if you can afford a boat i think you can afford flares i didn't think that was a very good argument just for future reference and but but senator Laird had a great point too i've got a similar situation where we had a munitions company on the plateau overlooking santa clarita it was there for 70 years and all they did was just dump stuff out the back it's been 22 years and we finally just cleaned up most of it, but we still have to continue to filter the water because of the, the chloride uh, plume in the Sagas aquifer. So there's a lot of costs down the road if we don't do, and I don't know why we haven't done this sooner. So I, I salute you for doing this bill. Happy to support today. Ready, thank you. All right, seeing no further. Uh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, Senator Blakespear, would you like to close? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Laird, and thank you, Senator Wilk, for your comments on this. Um, and, and also to all the supporters who came and, and also the opponents, uh, we're continuing to work together. I think the point about the externalities are there, somebody is paying them. So the question is who, and also what are the risks we're taking by having those externalities? A boat that has 40 flares on it, marine flares, if there is a fire, the explosives that could happen on that boat, uh, are, are really substantial and serious. There's a reason that these don't go into the recycling and that they're not supposed to be set off and thrown into the water. So they are toxic, they are explosives, they need to be treated as such. And so this is a program that will um, hopefully handle that. And, and I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Senator Blakespear. All right, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. This is file item number four, SB 1066. The motion is to pass as amended to Senate Appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, I. Wilk. I. Wilk, I. Allen. Allen, I. Ashby. Aye. Ashby, I. Caballero. Aye. Caballero, I. Durazo. Laird. Laird, I. Min. Nilo. Aye. Nilo, I. Stern. Aye. Stern, I. Wahab. Wahab, I. Nine to zero. Nine zero. Put that on call. Thank you very much. All right. Next, I see Senator Eggman. Senator Eggman has two bills. Then we'll turn to Senator Bradford and then Senator Glazer. All right. Senator Eggman, item number eight, SB 1238. Thank you very much. Um, SB 1238. So last year, many of you may remember, we passed SB 43, 
which redefined what it means to be gravely disabled in California. And we knew that there would have to be some cleanup after that um, because we've expanded the population. We also know we need to expand the facilities. And so what we have found is, you know, I think folks thought we couldn't get this done. And so we were kind of late getting some um, technical assistance. And, and so now we're finding as we're trying to implement, um, there are, you know, some laws that you, you can't admit somebody with a substance abuse only diagnosis, which now we've said that can be. So we need to change that law. So what this bill does, in effect, is to try to, um, in addition to to still needing more beds, we all know that, but to make use of the ones we have. So first what it does is it authorizes psychiatric health facilities and mental health rehabilitation centers to admit patients with standalone substance abuse diagnosis as we as we made the law say. Second, it disbands the designation, the definition of a designated facility to include a SNF, a social rehabilitation facility, as long as that facility has the appropriate services and staff. And we're saying that the county gets to designate those. So no facility has to be designated unless they work with their county to become designated because some places may be able to handle it, whereas others may not. So what we're saying is the county has that ability to decide who and who doesn't. And then third, to ensure there's adequate reimbursement where it's appropriate. We, the, the funding has to be able to follow. Facilities need to be able to bill. Counties need, need to be able to get reimbursed. So again, nothing in this bill demands that a puff or a sniff provide these services, but that they may become a designated facility um, if they want. Um, and we know that every community has different existing pools of already existing housing. We know more needs to be done. We think this will also help us get our arms around what counties, what some counties may lack, and that's what somebody else asked in a different committee. Like if my county doesn't have adequate and everything gets sent over here, how does that make sense? But again, this is also designed then to try to get a um, uh, an inventory, if you will, of where these are. So we don't have all the facilities we need right now. We're continuing to build that. We prop, passed Prop 1. More will be constructed with our last round of B-CHIP. Um, but this will help free up uh, emergency rooms, get folks moving in the system, and get them settled to a appropriate level of care sooner. With me here to testify in support is Randall Hagar with the Psychiatric Physicians Alliance of California. Thank you. Floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Randall Hager representing the Psychiatric Physicians Alliance of California. Um, when we were proud co-sponsors of SB 43 and um, we're proud, proud co-sponsors of this bill, um, when we surveyed our members after the passage of the last bill, um, what we found that we heard back uniformly from our psychiatrists who are around the state and in particular, their psychiatrists who are also medical directors of facilities was that everybody was vexed by the issue of where do you put solely uh, substance using individuals who have become gravely disabled. So that's really the crux of the problem. And I think the easiest way through that is as we looked into this, uh, we found that things like mental health rehabilitation centers and psychiatric health facilities were prohibited by regulation from accepting the solely diagnosed SUD, gravely disabled individual. And so the, the, the easy way to try to get this process kick-started by, by no means a final solution is to allow counties to, at their option, to designate those facilities um, so that they can accept those individuals. I will say in relation to that, that our psychiatrists who are in those facilities already treat people for their substance use disorders, but these are individuals who have co-occurring disorders. So they have a severe mental illness, they have the substance use disorder on board, and they're receiving treatment for that substance use disorder in the psychiatric health facility and in the mental health rehabilitation center already. So we know this is a clinically sound way to get started. Uh, we think this uh, offers a, an, a, an, a, an immediate solution. Uh, again, the question from all the counties is what do we do with these folks? This, this offers a way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support, SB 1238. Thank you, Chair and members. Tim Madden, representing the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. We're also a co-sponsor of this bill. And just to share a little bit from the perspective of the emergency physicians, largely when folks are placed on a 5150 by police, they're brought into emergency departments. And our job is to stabilize the patient. And then they have a 
you either release them after they've been evaluated by a designated individual or transfer them to a facility that can treat those individuals. With SB 43, as Senator Eggman outlined, there are not facilities that just take those with substance use disorders. This leads to long delays for individuals who are stuck in the emergency department because we'll have no place to send them. So we believe SB 1238 is a great step forward to allow the counties to designate those facilities to take these patients and help us move them to the care that they need. For these reasons, we respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Others in support. Leah Barrows on behalf of California Hospital Association in support. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Brandon Marchi with the California Medical Association in support. Thank you. Good afternoon, Rachel Blucher with Nielsen Merksmer on behalf of the County of San Diego in support. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Chairman and members, Moira Top on behalf of San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria, as well as the full Big City Mayors Coalition, which is the coalition um, of mayors of the 13 largest uh, cities in the state. I'll ask for your vote. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Priscilla Kudos here on behalf of the California State Association of Psychiatrists in support. Thank you very much. Others in support of SB 1238, please approach. Seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's turn to the opposition. If you're opposed to SB 1238, please approach the microphone. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Lisa Gardner with the County Behavioral Health Directors Association. We represent the leaders of the public behavioral health safety net in 58 counties and two cities. And we respectfully have an opposed unless amended position on this legislation. Um, we recognize that SB 1238 would ultimately leave it to counties to designate these facilities. But um, as multiple folks already mentioned, nearly all of these facilities named in this bill are inappropriate from a safety and quality of care perspective. Um, as currently licensed or certified, whether unallowable by law or regulation for purposes of detention under the LPS Act, or because they are unlocked, lack appropriate medical staffing, or are inappropriate to serve clients who might be in the process of withdrawal from substance use, we believe this bill is currently written is an inadequate solution to the facilities discussions and the changes so critical to successful implementation of SB 43. In short, um, we, we believe it's not simply appropriate to place individuals in these facilities without taking a deeper dive into the legal, regulatory, staffing, um, medical staffing, and security issues um, around these facilities. Um, instead, we are requesting an amendment that DHCS convene a working group so that we can have a larger discussion. Um, and that working group we're hoping would include behavioral health departments, providers, and consumers to review these facility types and the kind of significant regulatory and fiscal changes that are needed. Um, we, we are committed to the timely and thoughtful implementation of SB 43 and to creative, thoughtful, and workable solutions that get there and look forward to continued discussions with the author. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, there's an opposition. Mr. Ch <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Senator Eggman, committee members, Deb Roth with Disability Rights California. Uh, we are the federally designated protection and advocacy system for our state. As Senator Eggman stated, this bill uh, is intended to aid implementation of SB 43, which expanded civil commitment criteria to include individuals with standalone substance use disorder. The bill authorizes placement of individuals with SUD in a range of facilities and including nursing homes and social rehabilitation facilities, which as um, uh, my colleague at CBHDA noted, facilities that are not appropriate or safe. We see problems with the bill because involuntary SUD treatment is not as simple as opening the doors of existing hospitals and other facilities and welcoming the SUD population. We think it's risky to implement SB 43 that way. Data does not support involuntary SUD treatment, so implementation really ought to be done with extra care. And I saw from the analysis that the Senator is taking an amendment to uh, allow informal implementation processes until there are regulations. Um, we're not sure what else might be needed, uh, for example, federal approvals. 
we think that what the behavioral health directors are proposing by way of a robust stakeholder process is an important step. Um, and I just wanted to say that with the population of SU, the SUD population being so much larger than the mental health population, um, it's important to note that one study found that individuals who received involuntary treatment. You could wrap it up, please. Thank you. Were more than twice as likely to die from an overdose after release than individuals who received voluntary treatment. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All right. Um, others who are opposed to SB 1238, please approach the microphone. Give us your name, your affiliation, and your position. Hi, Chair and members. Rachel Bogwit with ACLU California Action. We align our position with the previous two witnesses. We are in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's bring it back to committee. Committee members, questions, comments? Move the bill. Senator Stern has moved the bill. And by the way, uh, Senator Eggman, you've accepted the committee's amendments, is that right? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. All right, uh, yes, Senator Caballero. Very briefly, Mr. Chair, I just want to um, recognize and, and thank Senator Eggman for her work on uh, in this area. Um, there's There has been a lot of controversy over exactly how to treat mental health issues, and I really appreciate it. I trust your judgment. I think this is a really good bill, and I'm going to support thank it today. Thank you very much, Senator Caballero. Let me echo her comments. Senator Eggman, you have been a champion in this space, and, and I think all California is grateful for your uh, passion. Thank you. All right. Uh, has been moved by Senator Stern. If, would you like to close? Yeah, yeah thank you. Just and I, you know, I, I appreciate the opposition, and we will continue to work with everybody. Uh, it is not our intention to put people where it is inappropriate. Well, that is the farthest thing from what I want to do. And again, we're leaving it to the counties. The counties in the last hearing said they would then feel pressure from the public to 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 designate. You know, I, I don't think that's true, and I think we all feel pressure to be able to really you know move the system along in the most expedient and safe manner. Um, and so I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. This is file item number eight, SB 1238. The motion is due pass as amended to Senate Appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? Aye. Wilk, aye. Allen? Allen, aye. Ashby? Aye. Ashby, aye. Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Durazo? Aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Min? Nilo? Aye. Nilo, aye. Stern? Aye. Stern, aye. Wahab? You have eight to zero. Eight to zero. All right, we'll put that bill on call. Next, uh, Senator Eggman, SB 1491, and then we'll hear from Senator Glazer, SB 1424. Senator Thank you very much. 1491 is designated to protect our LGBTQ plus and female students uh, in the higher education. Uh, arena. All too often people go off to college thinking they're going to have a great time and then run into some issues while they're there. Um, so this bill um, set, does three things. One, we asked years ago, 15 years ago, uh, for everybody to have an authorized person that if someone felt uh, LGBT folks felt like they were being discriminated, they could go to somebody. Um, that has never been like an actual person now. We've given them all this time. They haven't been able to do it. We're asking them to now designate one person, make sure that person is a confidential person. Secondly, we're saying before any student goes to school, the Student Aid Commission then would uh, make sure that they knew that they were, that school was exempt from providing them uh, protections for LGBTQ or anybody else because they were a small private school, making sure that everybody knew that before they went. And then third, to require uh, the LAO to conduct an assessment of the community colleges, the CSUs, and the UC systems with respect to quality of life around these issues. With me here today is Craig Wolfer with uh, Equality California and Kavia from, is a student from, uh, and a director of policy for Gen Up. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members. Craig Pulse from behalf of Equality California, a proud co-sponsor. Appreciate the Senator's work on this bill. Uh, according to the U.S. Transcert, Transgender survey, nearly a quarter of trans college students reported being verbally, physically, or sexually harassed, with 16% of those who experienced harassment having left college because the harassment was so bad. Trans students of color were more likely to report leaving school for that reason. In 2016, EQCA was proud to sponsor legislation which required college and universities to disclose if they permit discrimination against LGBTQ students. Specifically, the bill required schools that claim an exemption under either Title IX or California's Equity in Higher Education Act 
to disclose this information to the California Student Aid Commission, as well as to both current and prospective students and staff. Unfortunately, some students continue to be unaware, uh, unaware of these exemptions and what the potential consequences might be if their identity does not align with their college or university's policies. Today, at least nine institutions are exempt from Title IX and at least 20 are exempt from the Equity in Higher Education Act. And students deserve to know which schools have a license to discriminate and ignore state and federal civil rights protections. Uh, we appreciate the staff from the Assembly Higher Ed Committee and Senate Ed Committee uh, for their report, which included a number of recommendations, uh, including this one, and it will build on existing law by requiring the Student Aid Commission to provide a written notice to students who receive state financial aid regarding whether their institution claims a religious exemption to state and federal non-discrimination protections. Uh, SB 1491 is an important measure to ensure that all students, especially trans students who are facing a barrage of hate and violence in California and across the country, are aware of their rights and any recourse they may have to address discrimination and harassment, and I respectfully urge I vote. Oops, thank you very much. Others in support? Mr. Chair, committee members, assembly member, my name is Kavya Chidambaram. I'm a freshman in college and a policy organizer with Generation Up. Gen Up is an entirely student-led organization that advocates for educational equity through the legislative process. I'm honored to be here today to represent Gen Up, the students of California, and testify on behalf of Senate Bill 1491. As a proud co-sponsor of SB 1491, Gen Up seeks your support today in standing with queer students. We deserve to be recognized, informed, and supported. The current court Current Ed Code limits the definition of sexual orientation to heterosexual, homosexual, and bisexual. But queerness escapes categories. It is so much more than three checkboxes can encompass. And when my identity is not accounted for in the definition, I cannot expect to be protected by the policy. Queer students deserve definitions that reflect us. One in every five LGBTQ students will experience bullying harass or harassment during their time in college. But of those, only a fifth said their college had clear procedures for reporting gender or sexuality-based discrimination, discriminatory acts. Today, you have the opportunity to ensure all queer students receive vital support. SB 1491 would ensure that providing a confidential point person to be there for queer students is not a recommendation, but a requirement. Our safety cannot be an afterthought. Queer students have the right to be informed when their higher education institutions are not required to grant them Title IX protections. By helping students understand what resources are available to them, as well as providing necessary avenues of support for queer students who are facing discrimination, SB 1491 is one step in making California schools a safer place for students. All students deserve a learning environment in which we are recognized and heard, all students deserve a learning environment in which we are safe and supported. All students deserve a learning environment in which we are informed and accounted for. Please take this opportunity and stand with all students. On behalf of Generation Up, I respectfully request your I vote on SB 1491 today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. All right, others in support, please approach the microphone. <laughs> Priscilla Kudos here on behalf of the California Faculty Association in support. All right, others in support, please approach. Seeing no one else approach the microphone. If you're opposed to SB uh, 1491, please approach the microphone. Seeing no one approach the microphone, questions by committee members, comments? No questions, no comments. Uh, is there someone? Senator Caballero. All right, Senator Laird has moved the bill. Senator Caballero. I just want to thank um, the, the individuals that testified here today. We hear you. and. Um, it, it makes um, makes sense to get this done. It, was, it, it never was intended to be a suggestion. It was always intended to be um, a commitment. And uh, since that didn't happen, that's, I think you'll see this bill get out of here with a lot of support. So thank you. Hardy, thank you, Senator Caballero. Senator Laird has moved the bill. Um, Senator Eggman, would you like to close? I could be more articulate than our witnesses. I ask for your eye vote. All right, thank you very much. All right, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. This is file item number nine, SB 1491. The motion is due pass to Senate Appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? No. Wilk, no. Allen? Allen, aye. Ashby? Aye. Ashby, aye. Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Durazo? Laird? Laird, aye. Min? Nilo? No. Nilo, no. Stern? Aye. Stern, aye. Wahab? Six to two. 
All right, 6-2, although Bill has enough votes to get out of committee, we'll put it on call. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, following our playbook here, we would have Senator Bradford, Senator Glazer, Glazer, and I don't see Senator Gross, so we're going to turn to committee members for their presentation. So if Senator Allen would like to present SB 1143, Oh, here's Senator Bradford. Okay, just under the wire. Senator Bradford, um, item number five, SB 1050. Okay. What? Mr. Chair, do you mind if I switch? Sure. Um, Senator Bradford, uh, item number six. 6 SB 1331. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. SB 1331 establishes a fund for reparations and reparative justice. During the last two years, I had the honor of serving on the California Reparations Task Force, the first in its nation. The work of the task force documented in great detail the history of slavery in California and the patterns of systemic racial injustice that continue long after slavery ended. We documented the racially motivated taking of black land to eminent domain, over policing, mass incarceration, and the denial of home ownership to practice such as redlining, uh, restrictive covenants, and on and on and on that created generational harm that still exists to this very day. People will often say, why should California provide reparations? California was a free state, a free state in name only. California practiced every uh, did had the same practice of every slave state. If you came here as a slave, you were treated as a slave. If you gave birth here, your child was born a slave. If you ran away, we had a Fugitive Slaves uh, Act that returned you back to the plantation that you escaped from. People will also say, I don't own slaves or I didn't own slaves. Why should I have to pay? And I say to them, if you can inherit generational wealth, you can inherit generational debt. This is a debt that's owed to the people that helped build this country. Reparations is a debt owed to descendants of slavery. It's, this is not a handout or charity of any sort, a sort. It is what is owed, it's what is promised, and what, what is 160 years overdue. I have had the privilege of serving in the legislature for 13 years, and we have voted on dozens of bills about wage theft. Slavery was 250 years of wage theft, the wage theft of African Americans. The harm from the wage theft uh, theft still exists today. The cost of reparations will be high, but so was the harm done to African Americans. And that harm and those disparities created continues to this day. Now, how will California pay for reparations? SB 1331 would authorize the state controller to transfer 6% of the funds that would be placed in a state budget reserve fund, special fund. Uh, for economic uncertainties into the fund of reparations and reparative justice. If there is no funding to set aside for the budget reserve fund, there would not be a deposit in the fund for the reparations reparative justice. If the budget is a reflection of our values and priorities, reparations has to be funded. Here to testify with me today is Don Tamaki, Mr. Tamaki is a managing partner in the law firm of uh, Min Minami uh, Min Tamaki LLP. Mr. Tamaki was a leader of the movement to gain reparations for Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II and has served on the reparations task force as well. So without further ado, I would ask Mr. Tam Tamaki to. Mr. Tamaki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Senator Bradford, and thank you, Chair Umberg and committee members. I served on the task force, and I also co-counseled Fred Korematsu in reopening his infamous Supreme Court case, which upheld putting Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Korematsu's vindication boosted our bipartisan effort for Japanese American reparations. Senator Bradford deserves high praise for his strong leadership role on the task force. Two years of work, 20 days, 27 days of hearings leading to its groundbreaking report, connecting the dots between the racial policies of the past and their cascading harms today. 
reparations is not just about slavery. While the nation's racial divide began with 246 years of enslavement, the fact that means black Americans as a people have been longer enslaved than they have been free. What haunts California is its full-throated support of racial exclusion right into the 20th century. When you compare the redlining maps of the 1930s to the 1970s against today's maps of the most impoverished, the most underserved, the most polluted neighborhoods, they align exactly. Between 1934 and 1962, billions in home loans were issued, creating America's middle class. But 98% of those loans went to white families. By 1940, 80% of the homes in LA had deed restrictions barring black people. The policies of the not so distant past created our present. As a result, white households have nine times more assets than black households. Black Californians have an almost eight year shorter lifespan. In San Francisco over the last decade, black infant mortality was five times that of white babies and huge disparities persist in just about every other metric that matters. To talk about these things is unpleasant. All right, thank we you, sir. If you we didn't want to talk about Japanese American reparations, but we ask you to consider black reparations now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next witness. Senator Bradford, other witnesses? Primary witness, so All right. I don't know if there's right, let's, let's uh, go ahead and ask those who are in support of SB 1331 to approach the microphone, give us their name, their affiliation, their position. What an honor this is. Chris Lawson, Coalition for Just and Equitable California, American Redress Coalition of California, Sacramento, American Redress Coalition of California, Bay Area, Lineage Equity and Advancement Project out of LA, California Black Lineage Society of the Inland Empire, all in strong support. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Raphael Plunkett. I am a board member for LEAP Lineage Equity Advancement Project, and I've traveled here from Diamond Bar to express our support. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, good afternoon, Darlene Cromedy. I'm a member of the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, CJEC, as well as American Redress Coalition of California Bay Area, ARC Bay Area, and I am in strong support. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Kim Mims. I'm with the Coalition for Just and Equitable California, CJEC, um, American Redress Coalition of California, ARC Sacramento Branch, and Amend the Mass Media Group in strong support of 1331. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Marie Matsone, Ben the ARC Jewish Action California in strong support. Thank you. Richard Ehrlich, constituent of Senator Roger Nilo, in support. Thank you. Hi, Samantha Johnson for the Greater Sacramento Urban League and the California African American Chamber of Commerce, in support. Thank you. Dr. Critical Truth Bay, Interim Prime Minister for the Republic of the Country of Haiti, and I'm in strong support of SB 1331. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Tristan Brown with CFT, Union of Educators and Classified Professionals, here in support. Thank, Thank you. Hi, Chair and members. Rachel Bogwit with ACLU California Action, here in support. Thank you. Jonathan Johnson, Alameda County Mental Health, strong support. Thank you. All right, others in support of SB 1331, please approach. Seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's turn to the opposition. If you're in opposition to SB 1331, please approach the microphone. Seeing no one approach the microphone, let's bring it back here to the committee for questions. Questions, seeing no questions or comments. Uh, is there a motion? Senator Laird moves the bill. All right, Senator Bradford, would you like to close? Thank you. The Reparations Task Force has pan painstakingly documented California's role in slavery and the decades of system systemic discrimination that follow. People can choose to ignore it. They can be uncomfortable with our history, but you cannot deny it. I respectfully ask for I vote. All right, thank you. Uh, it's been moved by Senator Laird. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. This is file item number six, SB 1331. The motion is due pass to Senate Appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? Allen? Allen, aye. Ashby? Aye. Ashby, aye. Caballero? Aye. Caballero, aye. Grasso? Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Min? Nilo? No. Nilo, no. Stern? 
Wahab. Five to one. We're going to put that on call. Senator Bradford, Senator Bradford, next. SB uh, 1050, file number five. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm proud to present SB 1050. This bill will create a pathway to return land or provide restitution for Californians who've had their land or their property taken by the state or local governments for racially motivated reasons. Many, many Californians are familiar with the name Bruce's Beach, the history of the beachfront property uh, parcel land in Manhattan Beach. I was honored to author the bill uh, three years ago uh, that helped return the property to the heirs of Charles and Willa Bruce, a black couple who in 1912 started a beach resort in Manhattan Beach for African Americans to recreate and, and visit. But the city of Manhattan Beach resented the Bruce's success and popularity and wanted to put them out of business. The city used the power of eminent domain to take the Bruce's land and to do so for less than fair market value. In 2022, as stated, I authored a bill that allowed the return of the landowners, the LA County, to return the land to the descendants of Charles and Willa Bruce. Just like the Bruce's Beach, SB 50 will provide a broad pathway to justice to, for others who were harmed by similar racist policies and practices of the distant and recent past. We know Bruce's Beach is not a single story of racist government actions. The power of eminent domain has been repeatedly abused to move black and brown people off their land, destroy homes, to devastate the, uh, the opportunity for families to build intergenerational wealth through owning land. We all know about the recent story of Section 14 in Palm Springs. We know about San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, San Diego, Kalima, and Russell City, just to name a few. Let's talk about Russell City. This was a black and Latino community that's now part of the city of Hayward in the East Bay. In the 1920s through the 1950s, Russell City was a thriving community of homes and businesses. But the town was annexed by the city of Hayward, and then eminent domain was used to evict the residents in order to build an industrial park. SB 1050 will create a way for the state to review claims of abuse and determine whether compensation is warranted. The bill is de designed to have a similar structure of the California Victims Compensation Board that has the closest correlation as it provides restitution to Californians who have been harmed through no fault of their own. Testifying with me today in support of 1050 is Jesse Johnson. Jesse lived in Russell City before being force, forcefully removed from her home. She is joined here today by her son, Jonathan, and her grandson, Christian. I'm honored to have the Johnson family here to share their story. Also testifying today is Kavon Ward. She is the co-founder of the organization Where's My Land? and was instrumental in our work in returning to Bruce's property. And her work focuses on securing the return of formerly Black-owned land that was unjustly taken. I respectfully ask for I vote. Thank you very much. Ms. Good Johnson, evening, the floor is yours. Senator. Good evening, Senator Bradford and the hearing committee. I'm glad to be here and represent that I was a resident in 1963 when we were forced out of our land that we owned. Both my mother-in-law and my grandparents were, which was Bernie Patterson and Cassie Patterson. My mother-in-law was Jesse May Henry, and we were forced off of our land, forced out of our land. You can't see pain, but you, you can feel it. You can feel it, but you can't see it. It did hurt, and it hurt very badly. So my husband served our country during that time in the Navy. When he came home, people, a land had been burned up, our houses had been burned down, and our homes were devastated. And to see my grandparents have to drive away from the homes that they had, had groceries and had animals and had all those wonderful things that kept us alive. And so I'm very happy that you're here to hear, hear the hurt and the pain that I would like to express, but it's expressed from the heavens now, from my grandparents who are speaking through me now. Please give us our land back. 
We want to be paid and compensated for the hurt and the loss. And now that the businesses that there are that are thriving, um, they are thriving and and receiving monies. Please give us our land back. We want to be paid and compensated. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your eloquent testimony. Others in support? Senator Bradford? Kavon Ward, she's right. gonna be speaking now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kavon Ward, and I'm the founder of Justice for Bruce's Beach and Where is My Land, both organizations created to support black people and their quest to reclaim land stolen from them through the guise of eminent domain and other racially motivated policies and practices. Senator Bradford, thank you for the opportunity to present before this committee today. I had the honor of working with Senator Bradford to push forward SB 796, a bill created to make it possible for the land to be returned to the Bruce family. His determination, his grit, and his passion for reparative justice are in direct in alignment with mine, so I feel privileged to share time and space with him and his team to ensure the passage of SB 1050. Approximately 20% of current Where Is My Land claims in the pipeline cite eminent domain as their source of their land loss. According to Eminent Domain and African Americans, a 2007 report for the Institute of Justice, it states that between 1949 and 1973, 2,532 projects were carried out and 992 cities that displaced 1 million people, two thirds of which were black people. So how do we heal a harm like that? We provide compensation like the Senator is proposing and we give land back. The initial bill is, it's a great, First start. I look forward to seeing the bill evolve to include land returned to the victims of racially based eminent domain, similar to the justice afforded to the Bruce family, especially if the land taken is used for private use, like in Santa Monica, where Ebony Beach Club owner Silas White's land was raised in 1958 so that the city of Santa Monica could build a parking lot. The Viceroy Hotel now stands on that land. And like in Russell City, where approximately 250 families were forced from their land. Well, now multi-million dollar companies utilize that land and profit significantly from it. Most members of Russell City's Descendants for Restorative Justice want and deserve more than compensation. They demand land back. Jessie May deserves her land back. I thank you all for your support on this bill and for understanding that racially based harm requires racially based repair. And I thank this committee for their support to Senator Bradford around the passage of this important and historical legislation. We made history with SB 796. Let's make history with SB 1050. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, other witnesses in support, please approach the microphone. Give us your name, your affiliation, your position. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Tristan Brown, CFT, here in support. Hello, Rachel Bogwet, ACLU California Action and Support. Hello, Marie Mazzone, and the Art Jewish Action California in support. Richard Erla, constituent of Senator Roger Nilo in support. Thank you. Josh Cogger on behalf of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors in support. Samantha Johnson for the Greater Sacramento Urban League and the California African American Chamber of Commerce in support. Thank you. Hello again, Raphael Plunkett from LEAP in support. Thank you. Christian Johnson of uh, ABC News in support. Thank you. Jonathan Johnson, Alameda County Mental Health in support. Thank you. Darlene Cremony from CJEC and Arc Bay Area in total support. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Mims with CJEC, Arc, and ETM Media Group in full support. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Truth Bray, interim prime minister for Republic of Haiti in full support of 1050. Thank you. All right, others in support? Seeing no one else approach the microphone, let's turn to the opposition. If you're opposed to SB 1050, please approach the microphone. Seeing no one approach the microphone, let's bring it back to committee for questions, uh, comments by committee members. Questions or comments? Seeing no questions or comments, is there a motion? Senator Durazo has moved the bill. All right, Senator Bradford, would you like to close? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Niello. Sure. I feel it important to explain my position. When when I first heard about this bill, and I was familiar with the uh, Bruce's Beach um, injustice, and happy to see that fixed, 
um, my initial reaction was this is a piece of legislation that I could support. But you made it the responsibility of all of the taxpayers of California for the injustice of local jurisdictions. Um, Manhattan Beach was responsible for what happened, not Modoc County. Um, and anything else that's gonna be uh, reviewed by this, um, through this process, there'll be no responsibility on behalf of the entity that caused the injustice in the first place. Uh, Los Angeles County is in support of this. So uh, to the extent that <clears throat> issues like this happened, <clears throat> excuse me, in Los Angeles County, if they were to be responsible for it, I don't know if they'd be supporting the bill. So my concern is that uh, the, the injustice is not going to be cured by those who committed the injustice. And I can't support that to the extent that a, a local jurisdiction commits that injustice and then the uh, taxpayers of the entire state have to uh, pay the damages. Doesn't that seems to me to be a, a bit of an injustice also. So a, an entirely supportable concept that I can't support. All right, thank you, Senator Nielo. Whoops. Um, Senator Stern, did you want to? I think I'm shorting the entire electrical. All right, here. Senator Stern has a little uh, challenge. Let me just ask a technical question and then I'll come clean this up. Uh, just the 6%, the, the transfer, just wondering from the stakeholders how that number get arrived at and sort of how to look down the road a little bit at step two, step three in this and that special fund for economic uncertainty. So you're speaking to the last bill that we just passed. Oh, that's 1331? Yes. Okay, that's in it. 1050 we're on right now. Got it, understood. And I'll be supporting. And just to answer the question, the 6% is based on the popul African-American population here in the state of California. The population. We don't want no more than what we represent. Uh, okay, understood. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, other questions? I think Senator DeRosso has moved the bill. Is that yeah. correct? Senator DeRosso has moved the bill. Would you like to close, Senator? Yes. Baker? And I would like to just answer Senator Neal. This falls on the obligation doesn't fall on the state in and of itself. Local jurisdictions will be responsible if they played a direct role. And the prime example is, again, is the property of Mr. Silas White that was taken in 1958. And you have a four star hotel that sits on government owned land. The city of Santa Monica owns that land and they collect that rent every month on property that should still be in the White family. And we have example after example where you go down to Julian in San Diego. You can even look at one of our state parks, Allensworth, which was a thriving town in 1908. And because of the racist community, poisoning the wells, cutting off the water flow and diverting a train stop, it all but bankrupt that town. And it's now a state park, but it's no state park that any of us would be proud of because of its dilapidated condition. That's why I was able to secure $40 million a year ago to make sure that we invest in that park. So the damage is real. And not only should local agencies be responsible, but the state as, as a whole and the nation as a whole, because we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for many of the racist policies that still exist here in California and America. And I respectfully ask for I vote. All right, thank you, Senator Bradford. Um, it's been moved by Senator Rosso. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. This is file item number five, SB 1050. The motion is to pass the Senate appropriations. Umberg? Aye. Umberg, aye. Wilk? Allen? Allen, aye. Ashby? Aye. Ashby, aye. Caballero? Durazo? Durazo, aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Min? Nilo? No. Nilo, no. Stern? Aye. Stern, aye. Wahab? Six to one. All righty, 6 1 has enough votes to get out of committee, but we're going to put that on hold. Thank you, right, Mr. Thank Chair you. and members. On call, rather, not on hold, on call. All right. Uh, next, I see Senator Glazer. Senator Glazer, item number 10. 
SB 1424. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the, uh, your committee staff for their work with us on this bill. Uh, members, you'll recall that last year I authored SB 644. It was the uh, first in the nation law that guarantees consumers that they have 24 hours to cancel their reservation with a hotel or short-term rental or third-party website as long as they booked at least 72 hours in advance of the stay. I want to thank all the members of the committee, uh, all the members of this committee who voted for that bill last year. Um, and that bill only applied to in-state uh, facilities, not out-of-state facilities. Um, I, I was given advice in the course of that legislation last year that said there was some questions, legal questions about whether or not it could be applicable. And based on that advice, I removed that provision of the bill that would apply it to uh, facilities outside of California. And you all supported it actually in the original form that had both, but we ended up narrowing it when it was in the assembly. And I thank you all for that. However, a recent uh, Supreme Court decision made it clear that other states must comply with California's laws and standards uh, when they're providing goods and services to California residents. So California is now able to, and based on the feedback from the Attorney General, able to extend protections to our consumers when they book hotel and short-term rental stays out of state. So look, it's no doubt that when you're on the internet trying to book your stay, that you're trying to be careful and meticulous, but sometimes mistakes do happen. It just does happen. Um, so this bill expands on 644 by applying that 24 hour cancellation agreement uh, to out of state properties. Uh, if a consumer, a California consumer is booking there, uh, this will create consistent protections for consumers whenever they're looking to book a hotel or short term rental. Uh, they can rest assured that if they make a mistake, only 24 hours, very narrow, that they can repair it and not be uh, uh, charged for it. Um, and finally, members, as you recall from the legislation you all supported last year, if you're booking it within 72 hours of uh, going to that establishment, you can't do it. You don't get the protections of the bill, okay? Uh, and as you may have recall, we uh, exempted opaque listings like Hotwire and non-public rates for, say, special events. So the bill provides that one-day special window in case you do make a mistake. It's good for consumers, whether they're booking in California, the law today, uh, under this bill, would apply to out-of-state properties. With that, I would respectfully request your support today. And Senator Glazer, you've accepted the committee's amendments? Yes, the committee has asked me because of some concerns that have been raised about the ability of the platforms, and this is mostly platforms, not established hotel companies, the platforms to adjust their systems to uh, account for the provision of this bill. I've been asked to do an 18-month grace period and I've agreed to those amendments, sir. Thank you. Marty, thank you. Um, those in support, SB 1424, please approach the microphone. Seeing no one approaching the microphone, even Me Too support. Seeing no Me Too support, let's turn to the opposition. If you're opposed to SB 1424, please approach. Good afternoon, Chairman Umberg, members of the committee. My name is Rob Schnitz. Uh, SB 490 firm, introduced by Chapman Senator Stephen Bradford is the first Hotel legislation Hotel. that will create the California American Freedmen Affairs Agency. The CAFA agency is a recommendation from the California Reparations Task Force final report. Possible offices within the agency could include genealogy, strategic communications, data research collection, as well as general counsel with social services and family affairs. Tell your representative to support the upcoming 2024 reparations legislation. Find them at findyourrep.legislature.ca.gov.